you so on. Thank, thank you so much for being so many at this hour of the day. So good evening here. I've showed my conflict, my potential conflicts of interest. And maybe before we discuss when to discontinue antibiotics in the ICU, maybe we should see why it's relevant to discontinue antibiotics as fast as possible. As you know, it's already been said, we use a whole lot of antibiotics in our ICUs, whereas all the data that we have, which are observational, but they are appropriate for this type of study. Well, based on that, we know that about a third of antibiotics therapies that we use are treatments for which we have no documentation and uh, the probability that the patient actually has a bacterial infection is very low. Here I've shown you the relevant references. That's the first reason urging us to stop antibiotics quickly. We use antibiotics, in fact, and the previous speaker explained it very well, as soon as something is going wrong in one of our patients, and sometimes in conditions where there is no documentation. The second reason that's very important is that there is necessarily an ecological risk in using antibiotics in a patient and there's no possibility to escape the impact of uh, antibiotics therapy on the commensal flora. This is not my slide, it comes from the CDC, but especially in the digestive tract, the number of bacteria is so high that when you give an antibiotic, whatever, the spectrum of activity of that antibiotic, whether you use one or several antibiotics, in the GI tract, there is a bacterium which in its genome has the gene that makes it possible for it to resist uh, this antibiotic. Maybe the gene is not expressed, but uh, on the pressure induced by the antibiotic, this gene becomes expressed, and so the bacterium will be able to survive exposure to this antibiotic so very quickly. And after a couple of days of uh, antibiotics in the commensal flora, given the selection pressure, maybe uh, dormant strains will not emerge, but they will appear and they are resistant to the antibiotics that you're giving. There's no way to escape this mechanism. That's the second reason, an ecological reason to try and reduce as much as possible exposure to antibiotics in our intensive care patients. And just one study here, but there are hundreds proving the link between the consumption of antibiotics and the emergence of antibiotic resistance. I chose this study. Each dot represents a European country. On the x-axis, you can see the consumption of uh, fluoroquinolones. And on the y-axis, for each of these countries, the share of E. coli strains that are going to be resistant to fluoroquinolones. And you can see that there's an undisputable statistical relation. It's one of those studies proving that, but there are hundreds of those at every level, continents, countries, groups of hospitals, inside a hospital, and even at the individual level. The third reason why we should limit the duration of antibiotic courses in hospitals is the epidemiological situation in which we are to date. Two examples still using the same maps that we show you repeatedly. For instance, in our beautiful country to date, the share of uh, 
Pseudomonas aeruginosa strains that are responsible for infections in patients that are clinically significant, that are at least resistant to three classes of antibiotics, uh, the, the share is between 10 and 25 percent of cases. Fortunately, we're not the most affected country, but it's already a big cause for concern. And for the moment, uh, the strains that produce carbapenemase are still sporadic, but in Italy or Greece and other countries, now uh, they're above the warning level. So if we go down that route, if we still use the same comparison that was shown by Thomas, we're going to hit the wall and we'll do that very quickly. The fourth reason is also obvious. The pharmaceutical industry seems to have left the area of research in antibiotics. And as you know, as we speak, we're in a situation where for these multi-resistance bacteria, we may be defenseless very quickly because of the absence of new molecules on the market. Another reason, of course, which is the fifth reason why we should try to reduce the duration of ABTs, the safety margins that we have. This is work that was done already a long while ago, 15 years ago, by our colleagues in Bordeaux, Didier Grusson. This is a before after period um, study with its intrinsic limitations, but it's fairly simple because in the first period they determined the total number of days of antibiotic therapy that they had prescribed in their patients. And you can see that it's uh, fairly high, about 18,000 days of antibiotics. And in the next period after they had put in place an antibiotic stewardship program, in their ICU, they reduced uh, the number of days of ABT by at least twofold without any visible consequence in terms of mortality or even morbidity of patients in the after period when you compare it to the before period. And of course, they proved an ecological benefit because the number of resistance gram-negative gram bacteria dropped from 140 to 79. So no safety problem, an ecological benefit and an absolute demonstration that the safety margin to reduce the number of days of antibiotics is very high. As you know also, there are a number of randomized trials showing that you can shorten the duration of a treatment with great safety. This is a study that we did with the large number of you in the treatment of ventilation acquired pneumonia, micro microbiologically proven, and we weren't able to show the benefit of extending the treatment over two weeks compared to only eight days. And now for other infections, uh, there are data from when from randomized trials showing that there is a high safety margin to reduce the duration of treatment. This is a meta analysis done on urine complicated urinary infections with a lot of infections being responsible for associated bacteremia and you can't see that there's no benefit in extending the treatment in this type of patients beyond seven days. And as you know, for bacterial meningitis, we also have robust data coming from observational but also randomized trials, at least five randomized trials showing that short uh, therapies have no impact on neurological complications in the case of these infections. So five strong cases showing that it's probably possible to shorten the duration of antibiotic therapies. Of course, we need to be very cautious and not do it systematically. If you reduce the duration of ABT too much, of course, the risk is that there will be bacteriological and clinical failures, especially a high risk of infectious relapse.
Of course, you should compare this risk with what I've just said. Basically, uh, the emergence of antimicrobial resistance, the reduction of toxic effects due to antibiotics. It's important to keep in mind, contrary to what a lot of us are thinking, that antibiotics, like all other drugs, we need to think that they really have strong adverse effects, uh, neurotoxic effects of beta-lactamines or the emergence of Clostridium difficile and complications related to this type of uh, infections. The issue of cost may be uh, secondary, but it's also on the table. And the fact that we can shorten the duration of treatment automatically or systematically following a dogma saying nothing to see here, move along, reducing from two weeks to one week is probably simplistic. As you probably know, in our study for ventilator-acquired pneumonias, for patients infected by non-fermenting gram-negative bacteria, mostly Pseudomonas aeruginosa, we observed, although it's not statistically significant, we saw a percentage of a relapse of recurrence of the uh, infection that was higher in the group that was treated over only one week, although there was no uh, higher morbidity. So we have some safety margins to reduce the duration of antibiotic therapies, but these safety margins need to take into account the type of infection and the germ responsible for Staphylococcus aureus bacteremia that is methicillin um, sensitive. We have data showing that if you shorten the duration of treatment to less than 14 days, there is a risk of reducing the success rate as shown on the slide. When you reduce treatment to less than 14 days for patients who have at least one positive blood culture for Staph aureus, the success rate is only 64% compared to 100% if you go beyond 14 days. And at 14 days, it's 91%. You know that in this situation, it's probably possible to reduce the duration of treatment. It can be done in a number of cases, but only when clinical conditions are met, especially if you can remove the catheter, which is the point of ingress, if you can exclude the fact, exclude the fact that the blood culture is not evidence of endocarditis, and when uh, there's a quick evolution under treatment when blood cultures become quickly negative. Now the message is that, of course, in each of our ICUs, we need to be able to make explicit the way we are going to use antibiotics. Explicit, this means that we control the duration of antibiotic treatments and the way antibiotics are going to be used every time we suspect an infection. So how can we do that in practice? It's complicated. Here on this slide, I've listed five main rules that can guide us in uh, the way we can stop antibiotics. First of all, as was said earlier, we need to be able to discontinue antibiotics in patients who have no bacterial infection, infection that's documented. I agree it's not always easy, but in a lot of cases, provided that we follow protocols for care for these patients that include systematic uh, assessment of the potential site of infection with uh, good samples tr processed by good micro labs, it's possible to do that. I'll come back to the issue of uh, vancomycin or linezolid. I can't see the relevance of using these antibiotics if uh, there's no MRSA, apart from cases of allergy to beta-lactamines. It's probably possible to stop very broad-spectrum beta-lactamines and restrict them to patients who 
are really infected by a strain that requires their use. I don't see the point in treating a pneumococcus. Let's take the most illustrative example. I don't see the point in treating a pneumococcus that's sensitive to amoxicillin with carbapenem. That's the ultimate example, I agree. But still, unfortunately, that's what happens in a number of our intensive care units. And we need to be aware of it. The issue of biotherapies has already been addressed by Jean-Francois, but here we have safety margins so that we don't systematically use after a couple of days of treatment uh, combo therapy. And then we can probably limit the total duration of antibiotic treatment. Once again, discontinuing antibiotics in patients without documented bacterial infection. That's the first thing we have to do. This supposes that we are able to obtain appropriate samples from the potential site of infection before we prescribe new antibiotics. It's very easy to say that during a conference like this one. But the reality in our ICUs is that, unfortunately, in a lot of cases, antibiotics are started and then we get a sample a few hours later in a situation where it's impossible to reach a conclusion. The only message that I would like to extract from my talk today, please, by all means, in ICUs, it's not a major difficulty. We absolutely have to be able to take samples before introducing new antibiotics. It's such a simple rule that sometimes we're surprised that it's not followed. This means that, okay, in a number a large number of cases after we've sampled the potential site of infection, uh, we may introduce new antibiotics for reasons that we discussed earlier, and I fully agree with them. In patients with septic shock or uh, a situation compatible with septic shock or severe sepsis, you immediately need to induce treatment. But systematically, after two or three days, the need for treatment will need to be reassessed based on the clinical development, the clinical evolution of the disease, and based on micro results. And we have data which may not be definitive, but they are at least robust, showing that it is possible to discontinue an ABT that was started 48 hours earlier if you've really taken samples with uh, the adequate techniques. This is what uh, Raman aptly proved in critical care medicine in 2013 in patients with suspected ventilation-acquired pneumonia and uh, a bronchial fibroscopy samples with quantitative techniques came back negative. And as Christian said earlier, patients in uh, home treatment was discontinued had fewer super infections, fewer respiratory super infections, and mortality was not increased. And of course, there was a gain in terms of ABT duration. Coming back to vancomycin and or linezolid, all epidemiological data show that strains of MRSA are fortunately going down in our country, but the use of vancomycin is uh, decreasing less fast based on the data that I have, then uh, we could hope for based on uh, epidemiological data. And here I'll insist there's no reason to use vancomycin or linezolid if there's no MRSA infection. And I'll f insist further to say that if the infection is due to a methicillin sensitive staph aureus, it's almost a mistake to use vancomycin or linezolid to treat this infection. We have robust data to support it. This study has just been published by our colleagues in the US, very competent people in the area of ABT. They looked at 
how vanco, IV vancomycin was used in their hospitals. It's very simple. They looked at 185 patient records who received IV vancomycin in uh, American teaching hospitals were not uh, at La Pitié Salpêtrière, for instance. But you can see that these are striking results. In 9% of cases, vancomycin was used, whereas no culture was ever uh, recovered. 21% of cases, no culture showed the presence of a gram-positive germ, but still the doctors continued treatment beyond three days. And in 5% of cases, cultures showed the presence of uh, methicillin susceptible staph aureus, but still doctors continued vancomycin. And if you tot up the situation, 66 out of 185 patients received treatment that was not justified based on their situation. That's almost 36% in the cases of use. And if you want, you can do this type of studies in your hospitals, and I think that you'll get more or less the same results. Apart from Henri Mondor, sorry. Apart from Henri Mondor. I think, I think, but it's still true. I think, very honestly, but it's because uh, it's Christian Brabrisson that we're talking about. Step four, uh, discontinue combo therapies after three to five days, but I think that three days, that should be the maximum. And as we know, uh, there are hardly any data or even no data showing that extending combo therapy, including in the case of patients with severe sepsis or septic shock because of anterior bacteria or gram-negative bacteria more generally, there's no data showing that it improves outcomes. The only exception is neutropenic patients with very severe neutropenia. But apart from those, I think that now the data agree to show that you can stop aminoglycosides or the fluoroquinolones that were used initially. You know that our German colleagues published a randomized trial comparing moxifloxacin plus meropenem, which is not small, versus meropenem alone in patients with severe sepsis or septic shock. It's a randomized trial, and there's no benefit in terms of uh, the evolution of the surface core and no benefit in terms of survival. And these were severe patients. You can see that so far on admission is close to 10, 9.5, if I remember right. So severe patients, no benefit in having initial combo therapy, as was the case in this study. It's true that there are very few pseudomonas or such germs, but even for pseudomonas, we can think that extended combo therapy is not necessary. Step five, the total duration of treatment, not just the use of, of one antibiotic as such. Here also, very certainly, as I said earlier, if you extend treatment over much, well, because of selection pressure that you exercise mostly maybe not at the site of infection, but on the commensal flora, you'll see the emergence of multi-drug resistance or pan-drug resistance strains. You'll also expose patients to antibiotic toxicity. And let me stress that antibiotics are not such uh, innocuous drugs as you may think. and. Uh, there will probably be no impact in terms of survival or morbidity for these patients. Earlier on, I said that you can probably dogmatically reduce the duration of treatment. And for most infections observed in intensive care, you could probably use duration times of about eight days. And it's probably sufficient in most cases. I also said that it was probably necessary to adjust the duration of treatment to a number of clinical or biological parameters. You know that in this 
case, mostly based on the difficulty that we have to discontinue treatment. Why do we need a, a biological marker of bacterial infection? Well, because clinically, under pressure from our surgical colleagues, maybe to try and uh, uh, excuse ourselves, it's so difficult for us to stop antibiotics in our patients, and it's legitimate that we need a figure that may help us make this decision. And the use of a marker like procalcitonin or other markers that may be used, the relevance of PCT is threefold. And that's the blue curve with the triangles. You can see that the first advantage of PCT out of three or four other markers like TNF-alpha, IL-6 or CRP, after the injection of endotoxin in healthy subjects, PCT rises very quickly, very quickly, that doesn't mean immediately, but very quickly. That's the first advantage. Second advantage, uh, the peak concentration of initial procalcitonin is a reflection of the body's inflammatory response. And so it's evidence of the severity of the infection and the impact of the bacterial infection on the host organism. And the third advantage of this marker compared to others is that when everything's all right, it's the case when you inject a small dose of endotoxin, when everything's okay, uh, marker levels are going to decrease very quickly. And in a way, it indicates that everything's all right, that inflammatory response is going away, and so the patient can probably stop receiving antibiotics. Based on that, and that's uh, the merit of our Swiss colleagues, you can propose to use the kinetics of this marker not so much in the ICU to induce antibiotic treatment, but for the discontinuation of antibiotic treatment. Where they were wise is that they decided to suggest a scale based on the kinetics of the marker. This is uh, an argument in favor of stopping antibiotics when the concentration of the marker becomes very low with Lavoinmois and uh, Michel Voff. When the marker is below 20, 0.25, it's probably a strong point in favor of discontinuing antibiotics or when it's decreased by over 80 percent compared to the initial peak concentration. Jean, you'll have to wrap up, says one of the moderators. So robust data in randomized trials showing that with this marker you can discontinue antibiotics earlier, in, including in very severe patients. These are the results of the study. Compared to a control group managed conventionally, you can see the duration of treatment in patients. For instance, for a disease that I like, a ventilation-acquired pneumonia in the control group, the total duration of ABT was 9.4 days. Not that bad. I'm not sure that outside a trial you would have the same duration of treatment in each of our units. So with this marker, it is possible to safely reduce the duration because mortality is not impacted by the reduction of exposure to antibiotics. And as you know, there's a host of uh, randomized trials showing that in exacerbated COPD, it's possible to reduce the duration of antibiotic courses. Same thing for community acquired pneumonia and ventilator acquired pneumonia. And you can do that very safely without any impact on morbidi uh, morbidity or mortality observed in the trials. So once again, it is possible to stop antibiotic treatment with or without procalcitonin provided that you monitor all that, that you have an antibiotic therapy policy in your ICU. Once again, I insist on that. This probably means that you need to be able to monitor ABTs. Maybe not with a policeman. We won't go that far yet. But.